I believe in miracles because I believe in God. You are responsible before God for today. God wants to show His power and His greatness in our lives. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Welcome to the Ernest Angley Hour. Today I have a message for you bearing fruits unto repentance. No, friend, not everyone that prays receives forgiveness. Not everyone that wants salvation receives it. There are certain fruits a person must bear within their life in order to receive forgiveness, salvation, and a born again experience. It's all laid out in the Word of God. So get ready to be informed and blessed by this message. Tonight's message is based on a subject. Over 27 years in the ministry, I've seen a lot. There are people who come to church, pray, make a confession, profess to be born again, then sooner or later in their life, it reveals, well, nothing ever changed about the person. The person that came into the church is the person that stayed in the church, nothing different. For others, they would struggle within themselves, wrestling, battling, self, desires of the flesh, so on and so forth, just a miserable existence, calling themselves a Christian, wondering, is this the Christian's lot? Why am I this way? Up and down. Seem like every other week, every other month, they're back saying the sinner's prayer again. But it's the same old result. Why? Why is that? People would wonder why. Well, the Word of God gives the revelation. Not everyone that makes a confession gets saved. Not everyone that says the sinner's prayer gets saved. A person has to bear certain fruits in their life to, receive, to, be, to repent and receive salvation. If those fruits aren't there, they're just going through the motions. They may deceive themselves, they may deceive other people, but they're not deceiving God. And the title of this message is Bearing Fruits Unto Repentance. And I want to take you to start this message into the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Here, John the Baptist is at the zenith of his ministry. His fame has spread across the land of Israel. People from all over, from Jerusalem, Judea, and all region about Jordan are coming out to him. And the Bible says they're coming to be baptized and to confess their sins. However, on a particular day in verse 7 of this chapter, John sees the Pharisees and Sadducees approaching. And so now I take you to Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance." And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. You know, Jesus declared of John that he was the greatest prophet of all. So, considering who he was, what Jesus declared of him, let's examine more closely John's words. First, John questions their motivation for coming to his baptismal service. Why are you here? Who has warned you to flee from God's wrath? Now, these were religious rulers. 
and they were not being drawn by the Spirit of God. John is wondering, what's brought you here? That can be a lesson to us. You know, not everybody that comes to church is being drawn by the Spirit. Not everyone that comes to church has the right intents, intentions and good motives. Even the devil comes to church. So John moves in on them and tells them, bring forth fruit, fruits, plural, meat for repentance. So what does the word meat mean? The definition of meat is agreeable, fit, proper. Bring forth fruits, agreeable for repentance. Bring forth fruits fit for repentance. Bring forth fruits proper for repentance. This statement by John the Baptist is noteworthy because, again, I say John is saying that a person cannot repent and receive God's forgiveness and salvation without first producing certain fruits in their life. You cannot come before God with just any kind of attitude and mindset and expect to receive a miracle called the born again experience. John was telling these men, these religious men, they were in no condition to repent or be baptized. And John being full of the Holy Ghost, was speaking on behalf of the Holy Ghost. He had spiritual discernment about them. He knew the Spirit of God had not drawn them to His service. And yet they were there anyway. These religious rulers lived in self-justification, believing because they were Jews, descendants of Abraham, that they were justified before God. But John told them, your family heritage has nothing to do with you being justified before God. The fruit in their lives was self-justification through their lineage and self-righteousness by the law. Their fruit was not meat or agreeable for repentance unto salvation. They lacked the proper fruit. And so they went away empty-handed. John continued in verse 10. Without good fruit in their lives, they would be cut down like a tree and cast into the fire. Does not this message sound very similar to a message that Jesus preached in John chapter 15? Jesus, the vine, and we are the branches. The heavenly father is the husbandman. And if a life does not bear fruit, if a life bears bad fruit, the husbandman will prune off that branch and cast it into the fire. Without fruit in your life, without the right fruit, your life is cut off from him and cast into eternal fire. If you will come to the Lord to repent and be forgiven of your sins, you must come to him in a certain way. You must come to him the right way. That is bearing fruits, meat, agreeable for repentance. Understand this point, the point of this message. Repentance before God is not a simple, is not as simple as making a confession or saying a prayer asking for forgiveness. It goes beyond that, and the Word of God says so. For many people in society, they are like those Pharisees and Sadducees in John's day. They seek out repentance before the Lord without bringing the proper fruit of repentance unto the Lord. They may go to church, make a confession, say a prayer afterwards, maybe their conscience feels better. 
And maybe for a brief period of time, they start acting better. However, in reality, nothing has really changed within them. Their actions, their attitude, their lifestyle, for the most part, remains the same. The only change that has taken place in a situation like this is self-perception. Self as they identify themselves as being a Christian or born again. And yet, they are not Christ-like. They are not a doer of the word, only a hearer. Yet they'll sit in church, maybe join the choir, maybe volunteer. But really, nothing has changed about their life, only perception. James chapter 1, verse 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. This is a great hour of deceit. It's only getting worse. Over time, the fruit of their lives reveals the truth about their spiritual condition. I've thought it and said it for many years. Time will tell. Time will tell, it always does. True repentance unto salvation, true repentance unto godly salvation, a born-again experience, produces forgiveness of sins in your life. It produces a spiritual change on the inside. It gives you a brand new life. Jesus called it being born again. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Take note, the born again experience is not a resolution to do better. It is not attempting to wean yourself off your sins. I'll get rid of this sin, and then I'll focus on this sin. Then I'll get rid of that one, and I'll focus on the next one. That is not the born-again experience. That is not the miracle of salvation. The born-again experience is not going through the motions and pretending to be born again as you continue to sin and produce corrupt fruit in your life. Either you're born again or you're not. Either you're a new creation in Christ or you are the same old you. Either you're free from sin or you remain in sin. See the contrast in the Apostle Paul's writing that I speak of. Romans chapter 6, verses 18 and 20. He makes the contrast very clear. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Free of sin, a servant unto righteousness. Verse 20, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. When you were yielding to sin, in sin, you were free of righteousness. You had no righteousness about you. Paul is saying it's one or the other. There is no middle ground. There's no partially being saved. Either you're saved or you're unsaved. Either you're a servant of righteousness or you are a servant of sin. Which is it? Jesus himself said, no man can serve two masters, for you will love the one and hate the other. So who is your master? Sin or God and his righteousness? Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. There's the fruit. Fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. So, the only... The question is not only who is your master, but what kind of fruit is your life producing? Is it good fruit? Is it corrupt fruit? Or is there no fruit at all? 
Remember John the Baptist's words in Matthew 3. Without the right fruit, the proper fruit, the good fruit, the axe will come down on your tree, on your life, and it will be cast into the fire. So how does a person receive forgiveness from the Lord that they may be born again? To then become a servant of the Lord and bear fruit of holiness and righteousness. What is this fruit that's required? And again, it's fruits, plural, as John spoke. It's not just one particular fruit. There's numerous fruits, and I'm going to highlight certain fruits that must be present in you if you will come to Calvary, if you will repent and receive forgiveness and a born-again experience. To start, I want to take you first to John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, Jesus speaking, And I... If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. By Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, all people are given an opportunity to come to him, to be drawn to him. And Jesus also stated in John chapter 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is a verse that is not always dwelt upon. No man can come unto me except the Father draw him. That's the key. Here Jesus is saying to come to him and receive forgiveness and salvation. You cannot go by your own will. You cannot go thinking, when I'm good and ready, I'm going to go. Oh, no. No. You must be drawn by the Father. No person can take you to Jesus. No song, sermon, or teaching can take you to Jesus. Only the Father. And the Father leads you to Jesus by his Holy Spirit. Since the day of Pentecost, we have been living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Now, God the Father had his dispensation laid out in the Old Testament. Jesus, as the Son of Man walking among humanity, had his dispensation recorded in the four Gospels. But on the day of Pentecost started the dispensation of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit working on earth with humanity. And listen to what Jesus said about the work of the Holy Spirit on earth. John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. But here it is. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. So the mission of the Holy Spirit is to reprove. What does reprove mean? To scold or correct, usually in a gentle way, with kindly intent. Did not John the Baptist see the Holy Ghost as a dove? He's kind, he's gentle, that's his intent. His intent is not to destroy. His intent is to draw people to salvation, to save their lives, to give them eternal life. He reproves in this world. He works with people in an attempt on behalf of the Father to draw them to Jesus. He will reprove people in matters of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In doing so, many times he will work directly with a person in their heart and in their mind, dealing with them directly. Other times, he will use an instrument, maybe a child of God. 
who's yielded and full of the Holy Ghost. Or maybe he'll use an anointed song or anointed teaching or anointed sermon. He works. And if the person will yield to his working, it will produce great conviction. Holy Ghost conviction. So what are these fruits that must be present in a person to receive a born-again experience. For one, faith. Faith has to be there. You will not find forgiveness of your sins without faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is so important that Romans chapter 12 says, to every person is given a measure of faith. Every person has a measure. Now it's up to the person to decide if that measure will operate or not. Because if you don't believe God and his word, there's no place of repentance for you. Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, the A part. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Just because a person chooses not to believe does not mean they are right and the word of God is wrong. Let God and his word be true. And let every person that chooses not to believe God and his word be a liar. If you don't believe Jesus is the only way to salvation, there's no repentance or salvation for you. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you don't believe that you have ever committed sin, if you believe there's no such thing as sin, there's no place of repentance for you. How can the Holy Spirit reprove you of something that you don't even believe exists? Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But yet so many people today dismiss sin. They don't believe in sin. Everyone born into this world is born in sin and in need of a Savior. Who is Jesus Christ our Lord? If you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again the third day, there is no place of repentance or salvation for you. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, there it is, believe in your heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Only believe, Jesus said, from the heart. Not with the mouth, not from the head up. It's got to be from the heart. It's got to be from the heart. The whole you. That's what the heart means. you got to believe with the whole you, without any reservations or doubts. If your heart's not in it, God's not in it. And that's been the problem with far too many people. Their heart wasn't in it for whatever reason. God's not in it. They didn't find repentance. They didn't find Deliverance. They were not born again. Confession alone is not enough. It cannot be mental assent. Believing from the heart is the only way to receive salvation and become the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For too many people who call themselves Christians, they only have half of the formula. They're missing half of the formula, the most important part, the heart. 
Again, I say, and I can never say it enough, confession alone is not enough. It's got to be confession coupled with belief from the heart. Every Friday on the Ernest Angie Ministries Facebook page, we invite the nations of the world to send in their prayer requests, and we cover them with prayer during our Friday night miracle service. People are responding by the thousands with great testimonies of blessing and deliverance. Need a job? Post a message. Have a sick child? Post a message. In despair? Post a message. Seeking the divine will of God? Battling drugs and alcohol? Remember, Jesus said all things are possible to him that believe it. Claim your miracle by joining us in prayer and then send us your praise report with a comment. It is that simple if you believe. It's time to boldly step out and let God be your financial partner. Invest in this Jesus Outreach Ministry. We not only reach out to the world, but also to your local community. Share with us your tithes and offerings, and let us send you free books, magazines, and our weekly broadcast. Take time to grow in grace win souls, and enjoy God's financial miracles for your family. God's way is perfect. Prove God and His promises. Yes, friend, I do want to encourage you personally to give because what you give is greatly needed and appreciated as we continue to win souls for Jesus. Now, taking you back to Grace Cathedral for the conclusion of today's message. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. When the form of, of doctrine is delivered unto a sinner, the gospel message is delivered, they've got to believe it from the heart before they make a confession or else they're just going through the motions and no miracle takes place. And then many times they walk away deceived. Again, I repeat, if the heart is not in it, God's not in it. This is where, again, so many people become confused in their so-called walk with God or they're confused and turned off by Christianity. Many times people will make a confession or say a prayer of repentance and then go forth professing to be born again, and yet they're still a servant of sin. They confess and then profess, but they're still the same old person. Nothing's changed. And what does this result in for the person many times? An internal struggle. Up and down, in and out. About every other week or every other month, making a confession again. That's not being born again. When you're born again, you are brand new. The old is gone you are brand new. What's there to struggle with? People can make a confession of repentance 
and then a profession of salvation. But that doesn't mean it was from the heart. That's all from the mouth. What matters is the heart. You know, it is possible to be deceived by a person's outward appearance. People cannot look upon the heart. People can only see the outward appearance. God is the one that looks upon the heart. Jesus spoke of such in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It is said of God in 1 Samuel 16, 7, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God searches the heart. Therefore, we ought to search our own hearts. And how do we do that? Through the word of God. The mirror into the heart is the word. Does your life, your words, your actions measure up to the word? All of it. Not picking and choosing. All of it. The whole New Testament, the whole divine heritage. Now another fruit a person must have that is meat for repentance a fruit that goes well with faith is honesty. Do they have an honest heart? I'm not talking sin. You can have an honest heart and it still be sinful. Now God is truth and God cannot work with deceit. Jesus said, know the truth and be free. Know the truth about God and be free. Know the truth about yourself and be free. As I mentioned earlier, some people, they don't believe in sin. They don't believe they're a sinner. They're not honest hearted. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. They don't have an honest heart. Their heart's deceitful if they deny sin and deny they're a sinner. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. When a person denies the truth about sin, being a sinner, and in need of a Savior, who is Jesus Christ, if they deny the truth, they're deceiving themselves. There's no truth in them for God to work with. For God to deal with. In fact, their denials of truth, in reality, they're calling God a liar. There's no place of repentance for someone like that. The truth is this. There is nothing good about any of us. Nothing. Except the God in us. That's it. Remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? Jesus took the opportunity to teach a lesson. He said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, as the son of man, spoke, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, God. Again, he was speaking as the son of man. There's nothing good in our flesh. Only the God in us. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The truth is this. You don't deserve a place at Calvary. None of us do. That place of repentance that is there for you at Calvary is a gift of God unto you. A gift. You don't earn or merit your place at Calvary. You are unworthy of that place. It is God who deemed you worthy, who gave you that gift, that space at Calvary to repent. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The truth is this, no one deserves salvation. Not by your good works, not by your charitable deeds, not by your lineage like the Jews thought. No, no one deserves salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No man has the right to boast about anything, because every person without God, without Jesus, without the born-again experience, is worthy of death death in the flesh, and eternal death in hell. When you have a clear, honest picture of yourself and of God, of your worthlessness and God's worthiness, this will produce the fruit of humility. The psalmist identified it as a broken spirit and contrite heart. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Then in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. He will save those who have that broken, humble spirit before him. This is the fruit required, necessary, meat for repentance unto salvation. They that humble themselves before the Lord, he will lift them up out of that horrible, miry pit of sin to set their feet upon the rock, Christ Jesus. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus spoke of himself in verses 17 and 18. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The scripture that Jesus refers to is found in Psalm 118, verse 22. Jesus was rejected by his people, crucified. And now he has become the rock of salvation and the cornerstone of his church. And Jesus said, everyone is affected by him in one of two ways. Whether you're a saint or a sinner, whether you're a Gentile or Jew, every person is affected by him one of two ways. Whosoever falls upon him with a broken spirit of humility, if they come unto Jesus to give their life unto him, He will lift them up. He will save them. But whosoever the stone shall fall upon, whosoever refuses to be broken and humble before him, that stone sooner or later will fall upon them and it will grind them to powder in judgment. Another necessary fruit that is required for repentance unto salvation you have faith, you have an honest heart, you have humility, and then you have godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. The fruit of godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. 
but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Paul speaks of two sorrows, godly sorrow and sorrow of the world. And a lot of people in church have been mixed up and confused by the two. When the Holy Spirit can get into the heart of a person and convict them of their sins with truth, if he's able to do that, this produces great humility before the Lord. And with that humility, will come godly sorrow. Take note in the next verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. Now here, after speaking of godly sorrow, here Paul details what godly sorrow will accomplish. In verse 11, For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, there were those in this church who backslid. But the discernment of the Spirit in Paul revealed they had godly sorrow. What did it produce? That ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal! Yea, what revenge! In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. They were forgiven in this matter. When a sinner or backslider repents with godly sorrow, it will produce clear-cut change in their life. A godly change. The Apostle Paul exhorting the Corinthian church, look at the change. Godly sorrow has produced in you the carefulness and, and sincerity in serving the Lord, the clearing out, the cleansing of everything in you that was displeasing to God, the indignation towards ungodliness, the fear and respect for God it produced in you, the strong desire, the intense energy to please the Lord, and make things right before him. He pointed all of this out to them. The fruit of godly sorrow. However, the Apostle Paul also made note, as I said, of worldly sorrow. That worketh death. And unfortunately, many people have been deceived by worldly sorrow in churches. Repenting before God with worldly sorrow. Sorry for the pain that their sins caused them. Sorry for the troubles that their sins caused them. Miserable, feeling bad, wanting an escape from that condition and hoping and believing God will get them out of it. That's worldly sorrow. And that kind of sorrow has nothing to do with God. It's all about me. Me and the pain I cause myself. Me and the deliverance that I need to get out of this mess. Has nothing to do with Jesus Christ or God. Or the fact that you're a wretched, miserable creature, lost and undone, unworthy of anything that God would offer. thinking they are forgiven when they are not, believing they are saved when they are not. Godly sorrow produces true salvation, change in words, actions, and lifestyle. Worldly sorrow produces no change, no forgiveness, no deliverance, no born-again experience. It only produces death. Spiritual death. Jesus said, ye shall know them by their fruits, not by what they profess and declare of themselves. No, you'll know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 21, the words of Jesus. 
Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The same principal message from Jesus and John. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Godly sorrow is from the heart. Worldly sorrow is not. Godly sorrow, ye are sorry that you have sinned against your Creator. You are sorry, as sorry for your sins as God is sorry. And as God desires you to change, so too do you desire to change. Worldly sorrow is purely selfish in motivation. Worldly sorrow is sorry your sins were exposed and uncovered before others. Again, I say sorry for the pain, the sorrow, and suffering that your actions and lifestyle brought upon you. You want God to deliver from it all. Oh, you don't want to go to hell. What does that have to do with God and Jesus? You don't want to go to hell. Worldly sorrow is all about you. It's selfish. In godly sorrow, through these fruits that I spoke of tonight, with godly sorrow, you hate what you are. You hate what sin has made you into. A selfish, ungodly, unholy creature. In godly sorrow, you will see yourself as God sees you. That's the key. In godly sorrow, with that kind of revelation about yourself, you want to be different. You want to change. You want to be born again. And I remember on March 5th of 1995 when I got saved. The Holy Ghost dealt with me for weeks on end, and I told no one. Worked upon me in my spirit and in my mind. And then on a Sunday night, a youth service here in this auditorium. I don't even remember what was preached. I have no idea what Reverend Angeli preached. I came to this altar right here. No one prayed a prayer with me. No one laid hands on me. I poured out my heart to God, and I was born again. And not only that, but that very night, I lingered to stay and receive the Holy Ghost. Determined to stay until the sunrise, and I received the Holy Ghost, and it didn't take very long. From the heart. But if your heart's not in it, God's not in it. But when you give him your heart and your whole heart, all things are possible. All things. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. With the fruit of godly sorrow, you come into clear understanding that it's because of your sins that Jesus had to suffer and die on a cross. He who knew no sin bore your penalty for sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for he hath made him, God hath made Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made 
the righteousness of God in him. 2,000 years ago, crucifixion was the cruelest, most painful, most shameful way to be executed. And there were many torturous ways, but that was the worst in that society. Jesus, walking the earth, despised the shame of the cross. He hated it, as did most of society. Study it for yourself. There are teachings on crucifixion and what it was all about. Learn what your Lord and Savior suffered for you so that you could go to heaven one day. The most holy, righteous Son of God died in this way for us. His innocent blood flowed from that tree for us. This reveals, or it should, just how wicked, wretched, vile, and unworthy of salvation you are for such a price to be paid. This should reveal how desperately we need Jesus. Never take for granted the gift that God has provided you, salvation through Jesus Christ. Never become negligent with it. Never become bored with it. Never become indifferent. Let the Holy Ghost, if you have him, burn the revelation of Jesus and what he did for you in your heart. And never let it grow cold. Lest you become lukewarm and be cast away. We can never repay Jesus. We could live a thousand lifetimes and never repay him for what he did for us. He didn't have to do it. He willingly did it. And he and he alone is the only one who could have done it. And he came not by force, but, by, but of his own free will. Friend, listening to this message tonight, Nobody's ever loved you like Jesus loves you. No one has ever cared for you like he cares for you. You may be watching and feel unloved, that no one cares. Jesus does. And that means something. Because he is the son of the living God. He is the one who paid the price so that you could go to heaven one day. To live in a realm, an atmosphere of love, love, love forevermore, so that you are provided an escape from this old world. Jesus loves you. And if you believe the message tonight, the scriptures that I shared with you, it's time to come to Jesus. It's time to let the Holy Spirit draw you by faith to the foot of the cross. To find your place at Calvary. To receive forgiveness, deliverance, and salvation. The born-again experience that only the blood of Jesus can provide. The blood and the blood alone. Thank God for the blood. Say this prayer with me. Make this confession tonight. But friend, I emphasize, not only make the confession, but believe from your heart. Say, oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. Forgive me, Lord, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the blood of Jesus that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And friend, if you meant that prayer, that confession, the word of God declares salvation is yours. You are born again.
Friend, when Jesus died on the cross, it was a twofold atonement, salvation for the soul and healing for the body. At this time, I want to pray for you who are sick in body, those of you who are in pain. Remember, the blood stripes of Jesus will make you whole. Put your hand against mine on the screen as a form of laying on of hands. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you now. Lord, touch them where they are. You see the need in their life. And, O oh God, by faith, we put our trust in the blood of Jesus. And by those blood stripes, we are healed. In the holy name of Jesus, heal them now. Let the healing virtue flow to each one. Lord, to set them free, to make them well, deliver them in the blood name of Jesus. We'll give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. And amen. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and know God is moving and you shall recover. Also, at this time, I'd like to invite you to be with us in our services at Grace Cathedral. Every weekend, we have three services, Friday night and then two services on Sunday. We welcome you to worship the Lord with us. And if you can, make plans to be with us over the Good Friday Easter weekend. First, it starts with the Good Friday Easter Holy Communion service, Friday night, March 29th. What a blessed time in the Lord. No preaching in this service, just good music and singing as we honor the Lord's death and resurrection. And then we'll take Holy Communion. And friend, there's not a better time to receive a miracle or a healing than when you discern the Lord's body in taking Holy Communion. And don't forget about Easter, March 31st. That Sunday, we'll have two services, 10 a.m., 7 p.m. Join with us as we celebrate our Lord's resurrection. And friend, I want to encourage you to join us for our live streams. If you can't be there in person, you can join the service by way of the live stream through our Facebook page, Ernest Angley Ministries, or through our YouTube channel, Ernest Angley Ministries. There you can connect with us, be with us in service as the service is being conducted. And you can still receive prayer that way as well. People put their prayer request in the comment section. And at the end of the message, we pray over all of those requests and God is moving for others and he will move for you. And don't forget friend to, when you have the opportunity, donate through our website, help us to continue to take Jesus to the world. That's our mission. Go to our website, ernestangely.org. Well, I hope you enjoyed the message. We look forward to seeing you next week.